The air defense of the UK is still the Royal Air Force's primary role. Just as it was in 1940. After the fall of France, the seaborne invasion of Britain was next. But that required mastery of the air over the Channel and Southeast England. It was to be a classic use of overwhelming force. But it failed, because of the way air power was deployed against it. 25 RAF squadrons had been held in reserve to form the core of the defense. Squadrons which were equipped with the only types of aircraft at that time which could deal with the threat. The first thing that you notice actually, once airborne, it is just an easy, easy aircraft to fly. It's beautifully balanced, the controls are light, and actually the performance is, uh, is awesome, especially for its time. Uh, the takeoff roll, the acceleration, climbing to height is just staggering performance for a uh, you know, 1940s aircraft. And it's a, it's a delight to fly in terms of sort of when you would be flying it near the limit, for example, in combat. It is forgiving. Um, it's, it doesn't take a lot of, um, you know, you can really be brutal in terms of the handling of it when you're near to sort of departing it or, or close to stall. It, it, she sort of shakes, but if it does stall, it's just a very benign uh, stall, and um, it's really easy to sort of regain control. So it's just uh, a delight to fly, and you can see why it was such a successful combat aircraft. The staggering thing is the, the limited hours that the guys would have had flying this aircraft. Going into combat against hordes of Germans, it's, it's just staggering how brave those guys were. Um, and it, it really drives it home to you just sitting in the cockpit now, just, uh, just what those guys did for us in this beautiful, iconic aircraft. Both aircraft represent cutting edge technology, albeit 70 years apart. And you can really see just how far technology has advanced, you know, with Typhoon here we have uh, fly-by-wire computers really controlling us. But actually the aircraft's a delight to fly, as is, uh, as is the Spitfire and the Hurricane. Relatively easy to fly, um, clearly the performance over the 70 years has meant that, you know, the supersonic flight, the 9G capability, the uh, awesome climb and, uh, and agility that we have in this aircraft, uh, it's eye-watering. Um, but the privilege to be able to fly both aircraft it's, uh, it's just fantastic, and I say they, they just represent um, cutting edge technology 70 years apart. Then, as now, pilots were the most visible elements of what was in fact a very large team. The ground crews were, of course, very important because uh, we had to have our aircraft serviced every time we came in from a, a, an engagement. They uh, had to adapt themselves to the circumstances at the time, and uh, then they immediately we touched down and, and rolled to a standstill. They would uh, swarm all over us. The armourers would get uh, cracking on rearming the guns, and uh, the fuel people, the bowsers, would have taxied up. There was another party that would probably be looking around to see what damage had been done. The importance of those chaps was very much uh, emphasised when uh, in the uh, last two weeks of August uh, the Germans started bombing the, uh, this is during the Battle of Britain, they started bombing the airfields in 11 Group 
and other groups. And uh, the poor airmen got a real spanking on the, at those occasions. They were, were, were not for six and all over the place, but they still kept going. And when the aircraft came back, uh, they were back on their job. And uh, even though the various airfields were probably full of holes in the ground and, uh, and sort of damaged um, uh, hangars and, and fires and things had been started, they had a, a very hard time. And the team stretched far beyond each airfield. There was the Air Transport Auxiliary, the majority of whose pilots were women, ferrying aircraft to where they were needed. And those who detected and reported the incoming raids, with the new technology of radar, and the eyes and ears of the Royal Observer Corps. Perhaps most crucial of all in the battle, were the command and control structure and facilities that had been built up. Well, it is in modern parlance awe-inspiring, there's no doubt about it. It really is an extraordinary sensation to be connected in this manner but with 70 years of history. Quite marvellous, quite marvellous. Squadron 3-2. Intercept, Ray, 7542, Billy Victor, 7542. You got almost a, a friendly association with the controller. They were first rate, I think, there's no doubt about it. The, the information they gave was generally very good indeed. A certain amount of repartee went on uh, between uh, the sector and the squadron commander, but uh, sometimes when the language in the air got rather uh, perhaps uh, uh, strong for uh, a plotting table like this. <laughs> it was uh, uh, understandable that uh, the squadron commander should have said, no, you know, steady chaps or something like that. See these representatives of squadrons flying around here on the table. It really makes one think. With uh, probably 12 aircraft to each uh, movable block, so it's almost impossible to uh, see the sort of magnitude of the uh, operation. But uh, very impressive indeed. You can see all the WAFs standing around here too, pushing and pulling these uh, uh, markers around. But it was not always the same kind of pressure. Sometimes it was just waiting. In the summertime, in, uh, during the Battle of Britain, most of it, the Germans were sending over aircraft at starting at the early hours of the morning. Sleeping was quite an important thing in those uh, intervals between flying, as we did three or four uh, sorties every day. There was time for games of chess, um, of course, reading the newspaper and listening to the radio. Seventy years ago, many pilots went into combat with little experience. But not much was ever really going to prepare you for what took place in the skies during that long, hot summer. The first uh, big collection of uh, German aircraft that I'd ever seen was on August the 16th, 1940. And, uh, it was a time when they were sending over these enormous collections of bombers and fighters, perhaps 50 bombers at a time, which is, is an incredible sight. Then with, say, 50 Messerschmitt 109s and 110s hanging around too, when one had perhaps never seen a German aircraft, even one single one before, it, it really was a, a very startling sight. When I was first saw them, we were looking down on them. We'd got the height of the, we got height over them. We'd also got the sun at our backs, which was good. I can personally remember selecting somebody right at the back. 
Most attacks were done from the rear. Beam attacks were much more difficult because of the amount of deflection you had to lay off. And head-ons were very rare, but some of the aces would do those, uh, but it, it took some getting into position. But they were very scarifying for the enemy uh, to have a head-on attack. I, I did have uh, one bad experience of, of being shot up on September the 11th, 1940. We'd been tackling a, a whole bunch of uh, aircraft that had come in and, and they went into uh, what they called a defensive circle, which was a cunning trick they had of, of uh, going round so they could watch each other's tails the whole time. And I forgot about that you must never, never enter a, a, one of these defensive circles. <laughs> and in no time at all, I, I did receive a series of uh, uh, bits of damage to the aircraft. Uh, as we were sort of heading down gently towards the sea, I, found that the control column was still working and I could bring it out of it, its uh, diet. So I got back into the thing and uh, found I could get back to the shore and also to West Hampton, uh, which, uh, from which we were based. So it was quite a narrow escape and I, I did sort of thank my guardian angel for that. It was, it was lucky. Luck, luck comes into all this so much. Uh, one, one was unlucky or lucky. At <laughs> that time I was lucky. <laughs> Those who were defending Britain in the battle came from countries right across the world, from North America to Australasia. But they all shared special characteristics. They were young and brave. As they are now. The difference in 1940 was that they faced a casualty rate as high as one in four pilots. After uh, an engagement with the enemy, if somebody was missing, you didn't know whether he'd uh, been shot down, uh, perhaps into the sea, in which case he would probably be fished out by the air sea rescue. Uh, he might have been shot down in the countryside, in which case uh, it would be some time before the local farmer managed to rake up some transport to get him over back to the airfield. Um, so it, it wasn't usually an awful jolt uh, about the, the sudden uh, loss of a friend. I don't think we would waste our time uh, sort of mourning the, the loss of fellow pilots who'd come to grief on earlier trips. Um, because there's so much to think about and, and of course that followed on when you were flying. You hadn't got time to uh, uh, grieve. It hit you later on, I think. Uh, it definitely is more of a long-term thing. Mm. The Battle of Britain reached its crisis on the 15th of September 1940. With so many attacking aircraft that every available RAF fighter was committed. No reserves were left. But the line held. The seaborne invasion of Britain was abandoned. A national battle with the RAF as the point of the spear. Bravery and sacrifice had sustained freedom. I was uh, as unaware of any strategic uh, importance of what had been going on as the, the next chap. And uh, it wasn't really till after the war, I think, that one realised that it was quite an important uh, action we'd taken part in, uh, unknowingly in a way. I mean, it was exciting and it, it was unusually something that really had never happened before, but uh, I think it, one had sort of reckoned this was part of, the, part of what we were supposed to be there for. And, and uh, I don't think there was any feeling of it being a special event that uh, uh, would be talked about afterwards and thought about a lot later on.
I have seen a typhoon, I must say, I'm full of admiration of how they can fly those things at that speed and those G factors. I mean, we used to black out if we went into a steep turn, and you had rather to sort of wait a second or two before you came to again, because they have G suits and all sorts of patent stuff. And, and uh, as for their vertical climb, I mean, going up into the clouds 10,000 feet above, just vertically, absolutely amazing. I'd take my hat off to those blokes. It is the other way around, you know, our respect for them is just, just enormous. Um, and I have no doubt that if they had been born 70 years later, they would be jumping in a typhoon now and they would love it as much as they love their, their spits and their hurricanes from 70 years ago. While technology has changed, the principles of air defence of the UK are the same. And the spirit of the Battle of Britain lives on. Thank you.